right. Uh, the subject that I'm going to be speaking on tonight is one that's really important to me uh, because somebody taught it to me when I was one week old in the Lord. Uh, it was 1971. And because they taught this to me, being baptized in the Spirit, <coughs> I never fell out. I was like, uh, how many years ago? 40 something. And I have so many friends that received Christ that, well, when I did, that, that just fell out. I mean, received Christ and three years later shooting heroin, you know. Uh, others just drifted away, but the people that understood the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they never drifted away. Oh, they may have fallen. Don't get me wrong, but they got back up. Now, I believe so much in the subject matter of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I've been teaching it uh, ever since about 1973. And I've been able to go around the world teaching this. And actually, uh, for those of you that know that I go to Sudan every year and have been going for 18 years, I always teach on the same subject every year in Sudan uh, to the chaplains there uh, going through our Bible college. And it's baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it, it's so funny because uh, our chaplains are so funny. Uh, all the classes know that when I come there, they know what I'm going to be speaking on because all their friends told them. And I have a nickname in Sudan. It's the Holy Spirit's tutor. <laughs> they have that backwards, you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> but, you know, all I know is there's lots of jet black men in Africa that are chaplains now that are baptized in the Holy Spirit that are changing Sudan. Amen. Amen. And it's uh, just absolutely exciting. So, I just wanted this subject to be clear tonight. I don't want anybody to misunderstand this. Uh, I want to drill down into it so there, there, there can be no mistake about it because I don't want anybody to leave without it. That's really my purpose tonight. So we want to ask, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and why does God think it's necessary? I think you can't understand how necessary this is until you know what happened without it. And without it is the entire Old Testament. Now, God had lots of plans in the Old Testament for man. You know, we start off with Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve had the perfect situation. They were in basically kind of a paradise, you know. Uh, they were tilling. No, they didn't even have to till the garden, did they, Denny? They just had to go pick the fruit. That's how good they had it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, with everything perfect, God is their friend. They completely failed. Satan came in and deceived them. And, and they brought death into the world and transferred death to us. It was absolutely amazing that their, their first two sons, one of them ended up killing the other. That's what happened. And, and, and this problem just continued on. Uh, when, when, when murder started with Cain and Abel, that proliferated as years went by. Uh, until finally, everybody across the whole earth, the Bible says, was murdering each other everywhere. Uh, murder was just rampant until God got to the point where he said, I can't believe this. I'm sorry I made you guys. I'm going to destroy you all. And the flood came. We got Noah and, and, and his family and the entire world was taken out with that flood, except for Noah and his family and, and, and those uh, special <coughs> people on the ark. But you, you would think that uh, that would probably do it, but that didn't do it. Uh, we, we know that uh, as, as time went on, uh, man rebelled against God again, and uh, finally uh, God made promises to Abraham that he would, you know, give him all the Holy Land, and he would make a nation out of him, and, and he certainly did. But we know what happened with the Jews. They rebelled against God, and they did it heavily. Uh, uh, Moses came on the scene with a law, and God gave us the law. And surely the law would help us understand what to do is right. Well, we did understand what to do uh, uh, was right but we didn't have it inside of us to do it because we had our flesh and, and we had our sinful nature and God uh, realized that 
when the law was introduced that his people failed completely. So God wanted to put something in place that would give us the power to be overcomers because people were not overcoming. Thousands of years ago, he predicted through Joel the prophet how it was going to be. Uh, Joel chapter 2, 28 says, it's going to come about after this that I'm going to pour out my spirit. Now listen to this part. This is what's different. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, people were filled with the Holy Spirit, but it was a selected few that God would select and the Holy Spirit would fall on them and they would accomplish His will. We, we have classic examples of that like David. The Holy Spirit would come upon David and he would go out to battle after communicating to God, uh, asking God, you know, should we go to this battle or just pass it on? And God would speak to him and, and give him the win on that battle. But then, you know, he would leave David. The Holy Spirit would leave David. You can find a, a, a prayer of David in the Psalms saying, please don't allow your Holy Spirit to leave me because that's what was going on in, in the Old Testament. We look at Moses. Moses was doing the most outrageous things when he was filled with the Spirit from uh, you know, bringing plagues on Egypt to opening the Red Sea, uh, on and on and on. But then again, he, the Holy Spirit would leave him and he would rebel against God and you know, crack the rock three times when God told him to do it once and miss out on going to the Holy Land. Uh, we look at people like Samson. All of us guys know the story of Samson, right? Uh, was so strong that he took the, uh, what was it, the, the hip of the jawbone, jawbone of an ass and, and wiped out so many Philistines, it was just absolutely ridiculous. And we know his power came from his hair, but, you know, he had the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit left him when he rebelled against God, and he ended up having his eyes gouged out in bondage, you know, grinding wheat. We know that Daniel was doing the most outrageous things filled with the Holy Spirit, like sleeping with lions that eat you, and being perfectly safe, having God guard him. And, and, and yet, Daniel did not have the Holy Spirit stay with him, but he would come and go. So through biblical history of the world, people were singled out to accomplish God's will and they were given the power of the Holy Spirit for a time. But there is coming a time when all that was going to change. And I, I believe that the prophet Joel had his finger, if you might say, on God's pulse, predicting what was going to happen in the future when he said, the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on all mankind. And the reason I'm focusing on that tonight is because it means us. It's exciting. And after thousands of years in the Old Testament, we see this prophecy fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So you've got to realize that us being part of the church today and us having the Holy Spirit live inside of us, we're privileged characters. This never happened for 7,000 years. Amen. And sometimes we can take it for granted. But what we have is the best. Uh, Jesus had already told his apostles that, hey, this date's coming, and it's after his resurrection. And he told them to, to wait in the upper room until the Spirit of God would fall on them. And, and he told them this in John 14. He said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's going to teach you all things, and he's going to bring you to remembrance of all that I said to you. And uh, then in John 15, 26, he says, when the Helper comes, who I'll send to you from the Father... That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. And now listen to this part. This is about us. And you will testify also. It's not just Jesus testing about, testifying about the Father. This whole concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so that we will testify about the Father. And, you want, uh, and uh, you'll testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. And then that brings us to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where he finally says it. You're going to receive power with the Holy Spirit. And when he has come upon you, 
and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So all these announcements had taken place until finally the day came in Acts chapter 2 when all heaven broke loose. Mm -hmm. I want to read the passage to you because it's poignant to us tonight. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a, a violent rushing wind, maybe like a hurricane. And it filled the whole house uh, where, where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. The place was electric with the Holy Spirit. I would have given anything to be there, but it's almost scary thinking about the power of God being manifested like that. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed. And it says they were actually astonished and they were saying, why are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, res residents of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Aegis, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya, around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, from Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them in our own language, speaking of the mighty deeds of God, and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. So Peter puts the doubters to rest by quoting the prophet Joel, showing that this wasn't people getting drunk in the morning. This was the Holy Spirit being poured out on everyone. This was the birth of the church that we're part of. So no longer is God just going to fill a certain person with the Holy Spirit and then leave. That is the end of that era of the Old Testament. Uh, he was being poured out on all mankind, and never before, uh, never before in the history of the world has this ever happened. And one of the reasons the Holy Spirit was being poured out on us is, is to prove that as believers, we're going to go to heaven. It was one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit came. Now... Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, it means that our salvation is locked in. Hallelujah. You understand that it, it, it's not by our good deeds that we're getting there. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross, and as, as he sealed us with his death on the cross by having the Holy Spirit live inside of us. He goes, that's your sign. No matter what happens, you're going to be with me. This is all locked in. I've taken care of the sin. It's interesting. Paul really explains this in Ephesians 1.13. It says, uh, now listen to this closely. It said, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, now having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession of us, to the praise of his glory. On the cross. So when we receive Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, and He lives inside of us from then on until the day we die. But Acts chapter 1 talks about the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us, and we want to focus on that tonight and what it really means. Jesus described it in Acts 1 8, which we've read a little bit earlier. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So what are you going to do then? Why in the world would God even give you the Holy Spirit to power you up? So you shall be my witnesses. That's what the power was all about. Not to wave your handkerchiefs and say, come forward, I'm going to heal you. That wasn't it. It was the power 
to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So uh, the, the critical question uh, to ask from this most important verse is, what's the power for, and what took place when it happened? Uh, what's God's focus on this verse? And, and how is his plan supposed to be worked out concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives? That's what we're going to look at tonight. First of all, we understand that this power now is to be spread throughout the church. Uh, it touches all believers. Remember what Joel said. We read that when Joel talked about this day in Acts chapter 2. It's going to come about after this that I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Who is that? Your sons, your daughters will prophesy. I just want to stop here for a second. Now I'm a proud grandpa. Most of you know that. But I have a 10-year-old granddaughter that's an evangelist. She started sharing her faith when she was 8 years old. She shared with everybody at school. The first people that she shared with was her teachers. Mm -hmm. Now she's such an awesome kid. She's a straight-A student. But she has this gift of wanting to take care of people. She just sees other kids that need something, or especially if they're hurting, and she figures it out. She's got a gift, man. And, and so she's always going, sometimes she's going to the teacher, you know, did you know so-and-so here is really having a tough day, man. You know, maybe you didn't get to eat breakfast. Who knows what it is, but my granddaughter saw it. And so she's got this incredible relationship going on with the teacher, so she gets away with murder when it comes to sharing the gospel. They love her so much, they let her do whatever she wants. I mean, isn't that amazing? And it's really coming from what Denny was talking about with the love of Jesus and the joy of the Lord, because my granddaughter is just full of joy. And, and she's still out there sharing the Lord. So uh, this is for our sons and our daughters who will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. We got any old men here tonight? No. Nope. You know, <laughs> don't, don't you older men dare think that God doesn't want to use you. You guys got to realize Amen. it's the old men that run the place. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Here, here, here. Yes. Here, here, here. You know, and God knows we need some godly old men. Amen. We don't need some... We don't need some crotchety creakers, right? We don't need any complainers, man. What, what we need is, is some old men that have grandchildren and the whole family love to see them. Here comes Grandpa. Here comes Dad. You know, that's what we want to see. We're commissioned to go to our families and spread the love of Jesus Christ at home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, it, it's, it's really God's calling for us. And you guys, it's, I believe it's God's calling. One of the things that the Lord was speaking to me about coming here tonight is what our responsibility is about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Our responsibility is to take it to our wives, mm -hmm. take it to our kids, mm -hmm. and take it to our grandchildren. Don't you write those grandkids off as if they couldn't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're crazy. They're smart. They're smarter than we are most of the time. Amen to that. I remember I, I was a sales trainer uh, for a pharmaceutical company for a while, and I was trying to teach sales reps, uh, you know, how to close deals and, you know, how to do good sales. And so I brought my son in. And it, my son told him how to sell just by the way he talks to me when he wants something from me. I mean, he starts with the, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, the Ben Franklin clothes. Like, hey, Dad, if we go to the store, uh, do you think we should get some, like, ice cream or candy? Mm. That's the Ben Franklin clothes. It's the either or. So either way, you score. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, kids can tell us so much. They're so savvy. Dude, they, they, they pick up on everything. I'll never forget they even pick up on when we're carnal. I remember one day I came home from work and my kids were young. I think my son was five, my daughter was seven. And uh, I was just like burnt, you know, 
I had people yelling at me that day and just people, you know, being off the wall. And I, I just, I had it. And so, you know, I got home and I just went right upstairs, man, to, to the bedroom. And uh, my wife asked me a question on the way up. And I just said, not now. And, you know, went to my bedroom. And I heard my five-year-old son go, wow, what's this trip? <laughs> I heard it, and it sounded so much like me, it was scary. You know? <laughs> but our kids are smart. Don't write them off. Please take this stuff to them. What if you would have figured out how the life that you could have being baptized in the Holy Spirit when you were five or you were seven? We've written our kids off as if they can't understand God, and most of the time, they're so simple, they understand it better than we do. So we're going to re be responsible to take this back to our family. And the Holy Spirit is meant to fall on us, so go home and teach your kids and your grandkids. Second of all, we have to ask, how was this power manifested, and what did it do? So let's read it. In Acts 1.8, he says, again, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. So the power was manifested working through them to be witnesses. For some reason, the subject matters got off point. When we think about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, we think about doing miracles. And hey, I'm all about miracles. I I've seen them. I've been part of them. But it's not what it's talking about here. It, it, it's talking about taking Jesus Christ to the world. So, yes, they had fire over their heads that day. Yes, they spoke in tongues. But, uh, and, and yes, everybody heard them in their own language. It says we hear them in our own language speaking of what? The mighty deeds of God. No, a lot of people just get stuck on tongues. Look, I'm not against tongues. I speak in tongues. Big deal. I mean, it's a blessing to me. But in a way, I say, so what? I would rather have somebody that's got a gift in love than the gift of tongues. That's what the Bible says. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing because what happened here was a full-on miracle, and it was a revelation of God that day in Acts chapter 2. Uh, because this really, believe it or not, goes back to a curse that happened in Genesis. And... Uh, God told the people of the world not to build cities. He said, I don't want you to build cities. I want you to spread out on the land. Well, why don't you think God wanted to build cities? Well, how are cities doing today? Every single one is full of murder, full of filth, and full of sexual promiscuity, on and on and on. That's why he didn't want us to build cities. <clears throat> and so what did we do? We built a major city. And they built a tower that was going all the way to heaven. So the whole Trinity was involved in this one. It says, we looked down and said, if they keep this up, they're going to ruin everything. And so God cursed them at the Tower of Babel and brought in foreign, what we call foreign languages. Mm -hmm. Nobody could understand anybody. So nobody could build anything else in the city. And they spread all over the land like they were supposed to in the first place. So that's been going on. We still have the curse today. Although we do have Google Translate, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you're going to understand this a little better. Sometimes when we say speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2, we think of the tongues that is talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. Two different things. You go check them out. We're not going to deal with that tonight. That's a whole other sermon. But what was going on here is the solving of the curse at the Tower of Babel. Because for the first time since the Tower of Babel, where everybody was confused with different language, when the Holy Spirit came upon and made the church, everybody stood, understood them in their own language. And they were mesmerized. I mean, is this awesome or what? It makes so much sense. The Holy Spirit's coming. All your children are going to know. Your mom and dad are going to know. This is for everybody. So everybody understood in their own language. Just downright exciting the way God set it up. And 
Peter, the failure, who, who really turned against Jesus and denied him three times. And then, you know, left the ministry and went back to fishing. Most people would have written him off completely, not Jesus. Jesus, Jesus knew what he planted in his heart. And, and, and he brought Peter back to be the head of the church down on the Sea of Galilee where he kept on saying, hey, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. I don't care what you did in the past. Get over it, man. Feed my sheep. And so Peter's feeding the sheep in Acts chapter 2. Preaches just a fiery sermon. And 3,000 people enter the kingdom of God. And this, this wasn't just an emotional experience that day. We know, you know, we see... Uh, at times, people will give it an emotional response and then go back to doing what they were doing before the next day. That is not what happened here. Uh, You've got to check out how people respond to this message. Listen to this. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, Peter's sermon, uh, they were pierced to the heart, first of all. They were going, oh, wow, yeah, man. I want to do that. They're going, oh, my God, are you kidding me? We're responsible for putting the Messiah to death? Did you really say that, Peter? What are we going to do? That's what they were saying. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children. Don't ever forget that. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with any, many other words, he solemnly testified. This is not a giddy, happy event. Man, he was sober. They were scared spitless. Don't fool yourself. Boy, with the, you'll have to go back and read the message yourself. We don't have enough time to read it. But I tell you, I remember one thing he said. He goes, the Messiah was put to death, and you're the ones that killed him. Can you imagine saying that to somebody? That's what Peter said. And he said, with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So uh, we can see that these believers had just received Christ, and they had received the Holy Spirit, uh, and they were empowered to become overcomers in a dark world. It's exactly where we find ourselves, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. In the same darn situation. And this was far more than just an emotional experience. There, where they, they were here today and, and gone tomorrow. Uh, for once in their life, these people were devoting themselves to God. They made it their priority, and uh, it's not only that it had an impact on them, it had an impact on the whole church. Look, when you have people come together and they make a commitment to come together and make it happen, all of a sudden you realize there's a love there. People actually care about each other enough to come and not just be nonchalant and not caring about it. It's like there's only one thing that makes that happen, the Holy Spirit. We don't even have it inside of us to meet together. We really don't. It's like we can't be bothered, you know. But when you get the Holy Spirit inside you, you get this gnawing. You have to be with your brothers and sisters. You, you, you just have to be. You can't live without it. You know you can't live without it. But the biggest thing is what Denny was talking about. You get the joy of the Lord. Hanging around your friends that are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 46 in Acts 2 says, Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God 
And look at this. Having favor with all the people. That's all the non-Christians. You know, I can relate with that. I feel like I have favor at LA Fitness. You know, I play racquetball every weekday, Monday through Friday, with Mormons, non-Christians, just... And I've really gotten to know those guys over the past 18 years, because that's how long I've been playing. And it's just absolutely awesome. It's the only place I get to go to build relationships with people that don't know the Lord. And I love it. I really do. And it just, it's a slow, smoldering process until, sure enough, those people are coming to me. They're asking me questions, especially when somebody in their family dies or they find out that they have cancer. Then they want to talk to you. It's uh, just how it is. Now it's interesting, it says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those that were saved. So uh, what you have to understand is these people were not depending on Peter to be the evangelist. Amen? They just weren't. You know, the church doesn't grow through evangelists. The church grows through a multiplication process where you share the Lord Jesus with two people, and those two people receive Christ. And then those two people share with two people. That's four people. You, you get where this is going. It's exponential. And that's the way the Lord wanted to do it. Through discipleship, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what was happening back there. It's interesting. Uh, back there, when you looked at that church, there is what we might consider a bunch of nobodies. One of the nobodies was uh, Philip, uh, and, and Philip was a, a busboy. It says that he waited on tables, and he ended up being an incredible evangelist as a busboy. Uh, he, he had this sensitivity to the Holy Spirit as a busboy, and he was traveling, and, you know, he sees this... Uh, uh, a black brother from Ethiopia, an Ethiopian eunuch, and you know, he's standing in his chariot, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit's going, go talk to him. And, and so, you know, he goes, oh, I see you reading the Bible. You understand what you're reading? What are you reading? And he goes, uh, Isaiah 53. Well, if you didn't know it, Isaiah 53 is about the suffering Messiah. He goes, oh, let me explain it to you. And, and so he shared the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. And when he got through understanding the gospel, he goes, man, I want to get baptized. He goes, where's the water? Let's do this. And so he got baptized, and he sent him back to Africa. And a whole bunch of people in Africa got saved through that Ethiopian eunuch. I'm just sure of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This stuff is, is absolutely powerful. Listen to what happened to the church in Thessalonica. This, this is riveting. Because I'm telling you, I believe this is going to happen to us. I believe it's happening right now. But listen to what Paul said. 1 Thess 1.8. He says, so, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, Thessalonians, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, Macedonia and Achaia are, are regions, kind of like we would uh, describe Riverside County and Orange County. So it'll help you understand a little bit better. Uh, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone forth, so we don't have anything else to say. Paul said that. You know what an evangelist is. Those people in that little church were on fire, and, and they were so fired up from being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the power came out of them to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit did it and affected the whole region. Remember when the church began, Christ gave him the Great Commission, go make disciples in Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. You know, the church didn't really respond to that. Did you know that? Uh, they got comfy in Jerusalem. That's what happened. And so the Lord allowed a persecution to open up in Jerusalem. It was horrible, you guys. Many Christians, many Jews got killed. And so everybody ran for their lives. And they went all over the Roman Empire. And uh, as a result, people like Philip, who got out of Dodge too, ended up going to Samaria. But because 
He was empowered with the Holy Spirit. He had a cross-cultural gift to the Samaritans, who the Jews hated. They considered them half-breeds, and nobody would even walk on their land. But Philip did. I want to read you the passage of, of what happened with him. Remember, the guy's a busboy. It's good to remember. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the crowds, with one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip. And as they heard and saw the signs which he was before me, performing, for in the case of many who had unclean spirits that were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, so there was much rejoicing in that city. The bus boy went to Samaria and took the gospel. Sounds to me like the whole city got saved, or a good portion of it. So the Holy Spirit not only will give us the power to take the message of the gospel to the world, he gives us the power in our personal lives to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Remember I was telling you about when I became a Christian? So many people that became Christians, when I did, my friends, they fell out. It's because they didn't understand this. We, we're going to understand this tonight. So yes, we've been sealed. Uh, we've been saved. Uh, we have the promise that we're going to heaven. But you know what, you guys? We still have the sin nature to contend with. Amen? Amen. So we have these desires uh, to go back to the old selfish ways. And uh, those lusts that we have uh, can drive us back to the world and, and to our old lifestyles. The Bible says that uh, these <clears throat> desires to go back to the things of the world, it says that they're diametrically opposed to the Holy Spirit. And in case you're wondering what these desires are, of course the Apostle Paul laid it out for us in no uncertain terms in Galatians 5.19. I want to read this to you. Uh, because we're all prone here. All of us. Galatians 5.19. He says, Now the deeds of the flesh, they're just evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of angers, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, in a nutshell, you guys, I think that being in the flesh, flesh uh, makes you mean, narcissistic, and self-serving. Can I get an amen? Amen. And, and, and if that's how you're going to live in general, and that's the way it's going to be, Paul says, you're probably not even saved. Look, if you've got nothing going on inside of you, then there's probably nothing inside of you. That's just like, it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, now Romans 8, 5 goes on, it says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, um, let me go back to this verse again. There was something there that was speaking to me right now. Mindset on, well, we're going to talk about what death means here when it says the mind uh, is the mind of the flesh is set on death there is only one way we can tame this monster called the flesh in our lives just one way it's through the baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit because trying to deal with this monster without God the Holy Spirit it's absolutely impossible I can personally testify to that. Before I became a Christian, I tried to get right with God three times. And I was raised a Catholic, and I, I would go back to the Catholic Church, you know, and all that stuff. And I'd be good for about six or seven weeks each time. And then I just fell back into it. It's because I hadn't really received Christ. I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't have God inside of me doing it through me. It was just me, and I failed. 
And that's the whole purpose that, that Paul is speaking about here. So, uh, Romans 8, 12 says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you're living according to the flesh, he says, you must die. And so, the question I want to ask is, what do you mean, you must die? So, when, when we die, we're separated from this world, right? Amen. We're only going to last so long, and then we're all going to go there. Uh, when we die to the flesh, we separate ourselves from the works of the flesh. That's what he means by die. <clears throat> it's a spiritual process where we put to death the old man. You know, some of us as Christians, though, and I think all of us do at times, instead of putting the old man to death, we feed him. We, we feed the old man to try and get some semblance out of our old lifestyle, to try and have some fun of some sort or, or whatever. And, you know, God is saying, that old man, he's dead. And sometimes we say, we don't care. And so we grab our old man, our old sin nature, and we lift him up, and we put him on our back, and we drag him around because we're having so much fun, and we keep trying to feed him. You know, the old dead man. This is really fun, man. You know, we need to just wake up. Because the whole thing is God's got the joy of the Lord for you. That's what, that's what we missed. So maybe you're saying to yourself right now, uh, yeah, Steve, um, I know that we needed to be separated from our flesh, but maybe something happens in my life. I keep falling back into my flesh, back into those old sin habits. So what about that? Dude, that's a reality. Is it not? Don't give me an amen. You don't have to. Because <laughs> we're all in the same boat. There's only one way out of the flesh. We cannot fight this monster by ourselves. Paul explains how to do it in Romans 8.13. He says, but if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. He's not talking about salvation. We already got it. Remember, uh, we got saved. We got the Spirit living inside of us. We're sealed in the Spirit. We're going to heaven because Jesus died on the cross. Not because... We did good works. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. See where God's trying to take us? He's, he's, he's not trying to whack us. He's long-suffering. He knows what this stupid flesh is all about. He became a man. You know, he never sinned, but he sure felt what it was like down here. He felt everything we now look at this. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, we're a son of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. What's the spirit of slavery, you guys? That's us going back to our sin, being enslaved to our sin. We get in bondage and we end up just like the Apostle Paul. Look, the Apostle Paul was talking about himself when he goes, I hate myself. I do what I don't want to do. I'm not doing what I want to do. He goes, but thank be to God, he saved me like a wretch. And that's where we find ourselves. And, and God just wants to be our friend and our father, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. God's going to, first of all, I promise you this much, whatever you're facing tonight is your bondage. You allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power, you're going to break your bondage. The Bible promises that the Holy Spirit is more powerful than any satanic being that ever lived. And he's more powerful than we are. He can give us the will to do right that we don't have. Because we, we can't will it. You know what I mean? We can't just say, I'm going to do this! <laughs> and then we fail anyway. The Holy Spirit can do it through us. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption uh, as sons where we cry out, Abba, Father, God loves us in our sin, you guys. That's how it is. 
And he's going, look, I adopted you. You don't even know how much I love you. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to get you out of this mess. So come on. Let's go. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. That's a promise. You guys believe the Word of God? I'm going to read it again. But if you're led by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Let's all take that home today. Galatians 5.18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You know, we can't do this by saying we have to do one, two, three, four, five, six things right. No, we have to do things because we love God, because we love Jesus, and we, and we want to please the one that did everything for us. Amen. Romans 11 says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that's power, will also give, your, will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And when He says life, He's not talking about eternal life in this passage. He's talking about the kind of life that we can overcome our flesh with. This is real stuff. This really works. And God's going to do it for us. Finally, Ephesians 5.18 tells us how to do it. He says, be not drunk with wine, for that's just wrong, but... Be, be filled with the Spirit. And, and so God's trying to tell us, don't let all these things control you. Don't get loaded. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't buy so many big boy toys. You know, big boy toys are fine. But if that's all you're going to get to get off on life, you missed it. And the bottom line is they won't fix you. They won't give you the happiness that you're just driven for. God's going to give you that. And all these other things will be added to you. So I tell you, if you're, if you're not really experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in, in your life tonight, I definitely want to challenge you. Look at it this way, you guys. What do you got to lose this evening? I mean, what do you have to lose? Is God Almighty in His Word offering us this incredible power to have a breakthrough? Like we've never had a breakthrough. Here's who we're dealing with. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief, or yeah, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's who's leading you against God. He says, I came that you might have life and might have it abundantly. In other words, I came so that you could have the most exciting life that you never even thought of before. It's going to be riveting. And, you know, uh, I think God knows that there's a whole lot of excitement junkies out there. You know, they're all over the place. Did you know God made us that way? That was no mistake. For all you adrenaline junkies, like myself, he made me like that. You know, I was the guy that was taking LSD and going on a roller coaster, you know. Or let's make it real exciting, take some LSD and go home and have dinner with mom and dad and have spaghetti. What an exciting evening, you know. And, you know, just foolish stuff. Absolutely foolish stuff. And God put the intensity inside of us as men, as adrenaline junkies, to want his excitement. Now look, I'm promising you, if you get a taste of the Holy Spirit's excitement, you'll never let it go. Because you are going to see personal miracles in your own life like you've never seen. This is what Joel was talking about with a baptism in the Holy Spirit. So if, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I tell you, don't wait. you you, you got to do it tonight. Uh, there, there's only one person who doesn't want you to do this. And I think you know who it is. I'm not even going to say his name because he's so evil. We're living in the end times. 
Man, I hope you can see that. We can't wait any longer. You know, the point is, Jesus is coming back. And, and when he comes back, come on, we don't want to be in the bondage of our sin. It's that simple. He says, be sober, be awake. You don't know when I'm coming back. All these signs that we're living through right now is just like huge wake-up calls. Matthew 7, 7. We're thinking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. Jesus says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it's going to be opened. And, and God is ready to fill you with his power right now. Matthew 21, 22 says, And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you're going to receive, especially when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've already received them, and they're going to be granted to you. So believe God so much that you're just going to say to yourself, it's already, it's as good as done. That's how much I believe you. I know you're going to do it. That's what he's saying. John 14, 13, he says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Wow. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. Carl, if you could uh, get up on stage and just play something soft for us, we'd appreciate it so much. Sure. We're going we're gonna to do things a little bit differently tonight, you guys. Um, I'm going to pray a little bit here for you. And then I'm, I'm just going to ask uh, any of you that know that God was speaking to you tonight and, and you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you need God's power more than ever. I'll, I want you to come up here to the pulpit because uh, me and uh, Larry and Don, we're going to lay hands on you guys and we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit falls on you tonight. So <coughs> we'll just go ahead and begin. Play something softly so that we can pray and hear each other. Man. Father, I just uh, I thank you so much for the Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1971, Lord. And all those years, I, I praise you. Through the good, bad, and the ugly, Lord, I, I had the joy of the Lord walking through it all, Lord. And especially tonight, I'm sensing your good pleasure, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray that uh, you would lead many of these men just to feel free to come forward that you want to be prayed for, you just come on up here and we're going to lay hands on you. I'll just be waiting here for you. Larry, if you could come up. Don.